Hello and welcome to a show we're calling The World This Year. I'm Francois Picard and joining us is Lara Marlowe, Paris correspondent for the Irish Times. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Warm welcome as well, Hamdan Mostafavi, editor-in-chief of Courrier International, which brings you the best of the world's press. Into, in, into France. In, in, in a digest. Uh, yes. Thank you for being with us as well. Craig Capitas, editor-at-large at TRT World. Bonjour, mon capitaine. How are you, sir? <laughs> and uh, Gail Blume, Paris correspondent for Die Zeit. It's been a busy year. Yes. All right. The, throughout the year, by the way, you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter. Hashtag World This Week. Sometimes a single event does change the course of history. October the 4th, 2018, veteran Saudi journalist and uh, political act advisor Jamal Khashoggi walks into his consulate in Istanbul to obtain a marriage certificate. He never emerges, murdered by a hit squad flown in from Riyadh that includes the inner circle of Saudi Arabia's 33-year-old crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman. Now, dissidents often wind up jailed or dead in Saudi Arabia, but Hashoji wasn't just anyone. His columns appeared in the Washington Post. He knew many U.S. lawmakers. And by the time the crown prince was hosting the so-called Davos in the uh, Desert Conference in late October, many Western leaders and business execs had gotten cold feet. Craig Kapitas, is this a turning point, this event? No. Khashoggi fatigue has already set in. The Saudis are still selling oil. The West are so, still selling arms. Um, years ago, the West knew what it got into with the Saudis. It's a medieval culture rooted in the 7th, 8th century. Uh, no one should be surprised. Uh, the Saudis, whether it's been mm. a Mohammed bin Bonesaw or those who came before him, they've been dealing with their so-called dissidents in this manner, not for years, but for centuries. Um, so it's but back, hang on back a second. Normal. There's been uh, these uh, resolutions in the U.S. Senate, uh, the pressure so that the the Saudis uh, have uh, pushed their side to come to the peace talks in over Yemen. Uh, there's still blowback, and this is two months later. Resolutions are wonderful things. I'd like to see hardcore evidence. Look, the bottom line fact to this matter is that Western leaders would love to get rid of the young princeling to see him go, but they also know how to deal with him and the real politique of the situation based on many of the individuals on both sides of this story who I've spoken to, not only in Turkey, but the United States and Riyadh, is this young princeling isn't going anywhere and Western leaders are going to have to deal with him. Now, you can whinge all you want about what it did. It was awful. But what do you expect from a medieval society? Hamdan Mostafavi, you agree? No, I don't totally agree, but uh, I think Craig is right to say it won't change a lot, but it has changed um, <coughs> this year. Um, it has brought uh, two issues uh, on the front, which is first the one of Yemen that everybody had forgotten, and somebody usually, it's just, everybody usually uh, started to realize there was a war going on in Yemen, and this Saudi prince was uh, the one who did it. So at least that's something. Um, and also it brought um, a light on, on what Saudi Arabia really is, which is, it, we've been, the year before, we've been reading stories about this reformist prince that was going to change this country. And at least now that's uh, out in the open, he's not going to change the country. And as I am very happy that he gives the woman the right to drive, it's not really a change of society and Saudi Arabia is still what it's going to be. And the Khashoggi murder showed that to the world, to, to people that were going to think that you could deal with this prince differently than the prince before. So money does buy everything. At the end of the day, they will be back to business as usual. Georg Blume? You know... Um when we in Germany saw these pictures um, of the starving children in Yemen, uh, the next day the chancellor had to call off weapons delivery to Saudi Arabia. It just wouldn't, you know, have any public support anymore. And it showed, in a way, at the same time, how in Europe we acted differently. At that same time, Macron was, you know, bursting out uh, that Germany should not, you know, care about Saudi Arabia because France is, you know, doing important business with that country. And 
um, it uh, it is you know so sad that even on such an issue we are not together here in Europe. And uh, when when somebody is murdered like that, when children starve like that, and it, it really it, it's also a mirror of 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 what what we really have to get together here, a common position to Saudi Arabia. Yeah, that dissonance in the positions between, on the one hand, Germany and arguably Canada as well, mm -hmm. uh, and on the other hand, the other Western powers is something that's come up through all of this. I mean, for me, this. Um took away any shred of a notion that the liberal democracies, in particular France uh, and the U.S., especially the U.S. in this instance, are in any way morally superior to, to these dictatorships. Because when Trump said, um, you know, it doesn't matter really if, if he killed Jamal Khashoggi, um, we have $110 billion worth of arms sales to Saudi Arabia, forget it. You know, that means that any, uh, our son of a bitch, as uh, Teddy Roosevelt said, can commit murder, can commit assassination, and we don't care because he's, he's our son of a bitch. Um, I think it did change something very, very important, which is that it looked for, in the preceding months, like um, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and the U.S. were really spoiling for a fight with Iran. And, and one feared that there could actually be a war um, between basically Saudi, the Saudi Sunni camp and the Shia Iranian camp, at, at sort of World War III. I mean, it was really shaping up a very, very dangerous situation. And I think the assassination or murder of Jamal Khashoggi has lessened that possibility because, as you mentioned, the U.S. Senate would not, uh, is turning against Saudi Arabia. They would not allow that to happen. There's a War Powers Act in the U.S. And Trump would not have authorization to attack Iran. And, and I think, I don't think it's... It, entirely excluded, but the possibility of that has lessened a great deal. And, and finally, um, I, I think we should ask ourselves, how did the West get it so wrong about MBS? Because, you know, we love reformers and uh, he let women drive and he wore blue jeans in Silicon Valley and he opened cinemas and, and he cracked down on the Mutawa, the, the religious police in, in Riyadh and so on. In fact, um, a reporter for the New York Times who interviewed him for four hours talked about quote, Arab Spring in Saudi Arabia. And, and we just fell into this trap and, until he started doing very rash, destabilizing and immoral things. Um, basically, the West thought he was good news. Uh, so how did we get it so wrong yet again? All right. And through it all, as Laura was saying, one man would like to offer Mohammed bin Salman the benefit of the doubt. The CIA assessed that MBS was behind it. Uh, they haven't assessed anything yet. It's too early. That was a very premature report, but uh, that's possible. We're going to see, but we're going to have a report on Tuesday, and it'll be very complete. In the meantime, we're doing things to some people that we know for a fact were involved, and uh, we're being very tough on a lot of people. <laughs> Craig Capitas, what's the calculus of the president on this? I have a New Year's resolution, which I've started now. I refuse to. It's not January 1st yet. Well, mm -hmm. when it gets there, you right. know. Um, and I, but I'm going to trigger it now. And that is I refuse to discuss Donald Trump unless there's an American Medical Association board certified <laughs> psychiatrist on the panel. And as none of my esteemed colleagues here fit that bill, I will leave this to other people. But I will add one thing. I look at Trump as a dramatic character. I will leave the forensic autopsy of the <laughs> Russia investigation and all this to you guys. Uh, Donald Trump never wanted to be president of the United States. He did this to build his brand. He never thought he was going to win. And for the, Amer the American people were bamboozled. They love a good flim flam man in the United States. And that's what Donald Trump is. And there was this expectation shared amongst many of our colleagues that once Donald Trump reached the White House, that he was going to undergo this change. Well, he's not. He's monetizing himself. He's monetized the president. And we can touch, touch all we want. And he's not going to stop doing that. And with that, all take right, it away. So on that point, Lara, <laughs> you, you, you brought in a... A copy of uh, a Saturday edition, recent one, during the G20 summit of uh, the Irish Times, which uh, has on its front page this photo by uh, Reuters journalist uh, Marcos uh, Brindici of uh, MBS uh, uh, with uh, Trump, with that little smirk that caught your eye. 
the, the facial expression of MBS, though, I find absolutely extraordinary. And you have the impression he's, I'm, I'm looking at it on the screen now, he's looking down on Trump because he's, he's massively tall, big guy. And he's sort of looking at him. As, as Trump's no say. shorty, yeah? No, Trump is big too. But, but the way he's looking down at him mm. figuratively and MBS, like Trump, has a huge superiority complex. They actually have a lot in common. Uh, their, their behavior on the international scene, the way they just crash through things. And, and, um. and so we, we heard the remarks there from Trump when it came to MBS. We, all heard, we had that press conference in Helsinki earlier in the year where an Associated Press reporter gets up and says, well, who do you believe when it comes to Russia? Vladimir Putin who's standing next to you or your own intelligence services? And he effectively doubts his own intelligence yeah. well he's done that twice now he did it with with mbs uh, because the cia believes that mbs ordered khashoggi's assassination and he did it with putin but the the whole russia investigation um is just stunning i mean there are 37 people uh who have been um you know charged have, have actually been charged in this investigation by robert Mueller. Um, and Trump, you know, during his campaign was praising Putin all the time. He was opposing more sanctions against Russia. He was planning a Trump Tower in Moscow. He was, there are allegations that he indeed offered Vladimir Putin a penthouse apartment in his mm. Trump Tower. You know, so the guy should be tried for, for treason, actually. He can't but, be. No, let, let's I put, know he can't be. And the reason is, let's tell the viewers why. Treason can only be triggered as a crime in the United States of America if the United States Congress declares war on the country. We are not mm. at war with Russia or any other country yeah. under congressional fiat or mandate. Therefore, treason cannot be triggered. He can't be impeached either. Well, that's a, that's a political decision. And he decision. can't be indicted while he's a sitting president. Mm. There, so. uh, well, he can be indicted if the indictment is sealed. In fact, there may be a sealed indictment right now, according to some sources, which the court, of course, would not have to tell the public about. And that would be served when he finishes his term when of office. When he finishes yeah. his term of office. Mm -hmm. that, that That's how it works. But treason, anytime... I don't know. I'm, excuse me. My I start but to boil when I get treated. But, but Trump keeps saying. I think he, very recently he sent a, a tweet saying there is no collusion. Well, uh, collusion are legally legally collusion is only a crime in various uh, 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 specific laws relating to financial transactions, which which don't apply here. He can be taken out on the emollients clause of the United States uh, uh, Constitution, which says that a sitting president should not be profiting mm. from the job, and he's certainly getting mm. that from his hotel across the street and from other properties. There are ways to get this guy who I refuse to speak about, but the United States Congress and the lawyers there really haven't gone about it. They All right, prefer let, this let, nonsense. Let, let, couple there, of points. First there, of, there is no medical team on this set, but there is a legal advisor and it's Frank. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Your reaction to what Lara said a short while ago about how, if anything, the MBS affair has um, rendered more remote the chance of a full-blown war with Iran. What is true is that there was a, a narrative that was being built on by uh, this coalition uh, of Israel and Saudi Arabia and, and the United States that, that Iran was the big foe, that was the biggest threat to the, to the Middle East. It still is what uh, is commonly you know, sold as, the, as uh, the story. Iranians are breathing easier, though, as, as the year draws to a close? Well, there is, there is the impact of sanction, which is very harsh, but uh, it's true that the prospect of immediate war um, has gone uh, a bit further. And I think that the Trump administration thinks uh, they might dismantle the regime by sanction and by, uh, you know, uh, putting the, the Iranian people to, to revolt. Subversion. Yeah. yeah. Now, meanwhile, there's been scant attention to China's admission that since last year, it's interned more than one million minorities in re-education camps in the far west of the country. Most of them uh, Uyghur Muslims. Uh, here's a, a recent piece in the New York Times outlining how uh, Western consultants uh, McKinsey uh, discussed their work uh, at a retreat that they held four miles away, uh, Georg Bluma, from one of these internment camps. Uh, has the veneer gone off MBS? Has the veneer also gone off China? 
It could be, yeah. I think that is one of the most important things which which happened to the world last year, that we are not able to look at Xi Jinping as a continuation of who governed China in the last 40 years. You know, just this week or last week, they will be celebrating the 40 years of Deng Xiaoping reforms. And it's all a complete makeup because it's, it's supposed to show that China is a continuity of, uh, uh, of, of government when, in fact, the, the change of power to Xi Jinping is probably more brutal than in America to Donald Trump. Because, I mean, camps like these, you know, uh, edu we education, camps with a million people that's exactly the thing we never wanted to see again on earth and certainly not in China and many people in China governments also have been fighting to uh, close these camps many regional governments and officially they closed uh, in 2013 course. yes and it was a, you know it seemed like an accomplishment of China to get away of that tradition now they're back into it and, and everybody seems to agree that on the evidence. And, so uh, earlier we were wondering if um, Saudi Arabia's crown prince had overstretched. Has Xi Jinping overstretched? Well, you know, he's do doing all this talking about globalization, free market, and that he's with us, basically. And, uh, and, uh, and it's very, very hard now to keep believing in him, in what he's saying. It is, I mean, also how you ha we had this arrest of the Canadian, in Canada, of, the, of some... Uh, Buddy from Huawei, when they uh, turned, you know, arrested people from Canada just as a, uh, you know, uh, without any Effectively reason. Effectively a hostage taking. Exactly. I mean, it's absolutely not going by uh, international standards, seeming like they want to govern their own way mm -hmm. without listening anymore. And, and that has been exactly the <coughs> contrary to what also the Hu Jintao and Wen Jiaobao, those who governed China before Xi Jinping, they were so different. We we have to remember them, how different they were to understand what's happening now. Do you agree, Craig Capias, in the contrary to Saudi Arabia, this is not continuity. This is a break <laughs> with the past when it comes to China. I, uh, the China situation, I believe, or at least claim to believe, has to be looked at through their One Belt, One Road initiative, their $1.2 trillion global Marshall Plan uh, come creation of mm. ersatz NATO based around China. Um, the Chinese are looking at not grabbing land, but grabbing economic influence. Now, this is coming up against the United States, who for the past two years, actually a little longer, have been weaponizing the U.S. dollar. They have been attempting throughout the world, as you were just discussing in Canada with the uh, daughter of the mm. UA, uh, uh, I can never pronounce Huawei. Huawei, excuse me. I can never pronounce that, mm. Chairman. Um, so this weaponization of the dollar, I want to get back to it. We have to take a very quick sure. break. Stay with us. You're watching The World This Year on France 24. Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's a special year-end edition. We're calling The World This Year, The World This Week, in partnership with The Daily Beast. Uh, with us is Lara Marlowe, Paris correspondent for The Irish Times. Welcome back. Welcome back as well to Hamdan Mostafa, the editor-in-chief of Courrier International. How do you translate Courrier International into English? Uh, international Post, something like that? Global Post. Global Post, maybe, there you go. yeah. And it's a, it's a capsule of... Uh, the world's news translated into French. Uh, neatly done, I should say. Craig Capitas, editor-at-large at TRT World. And Georg Blum, a Paris correspondent for Die Zeit. Uh, just before the break, uh, Georg was telling us that there was a break in China with uh, Xi Jinping amassing more power and cracking down harder. Uh, China's president, unabashed when he delivered a speech in the Great Hall of the Peoples to mark the 40th anniversary of Deng Xiaoping's decision to open up the economy. We have actively promoted the building of an open world economy and a community with a shared future for mankind and pushed for the reform of the global governance system. We have unequivocally opposed hegemony and power politics and contributed Chinese wisdom, Chinese approach and Chinese strength to world peace and development. 
Hamda Mosafavi, are you are you reassured by uh, what you heard there from, uh, from from Xi Jinping? It's very well said, but uh, no, I'm not reassured. I think uh, um, it's true that he is different from other Chinese leaders that we have seen through the years because he's he's been uh, shutting down even internal opposition much more uh, than before. There's been no Congress and there's n there's no there's no not the usual demonstration of uh, of powers. It, kind of uh, keeps it close to only a few advisors. So um, it is, and he has been using methods that we have seen are um, much more out in the open than, than before. So is it, as we were asking about Saudi Arabia earlier, is mm. it going to be at the end of the day business as usual when it mm. comes to how we deal with China? Well, there, there is continuity in the, the open economy policy, mm. obviously. Uh, and... You know, we got it wrong. Back when, when Deng Xiaoping opened up the economy, the West thought that this would liberalize Chinese politics as well. They thought we believe in capitalism, that capitalism somehow uh, produces democratic freedom. It does not. We, we should have learned that. Um, there was an interesting meeting recently, the Anglo-American Press Association in Paris. I believe you were there, Francois. Uh, with Anders Rasmussen, the former head of NATO, and Michael Chertoff, who was the um, Home Secretary, uh, Interior Secretary of the U.S., who are both obviously big experts on this sort of thing. And they said that Russia is not a strategic threat to the U.S. because it doesn't have the economic and demographic strength it would need to really threaten the U.S., but China definitely is. And they, they Sorry, stress very yeah. much that China is what the West needs to worry about mm. in terms of, because it's expansionist, it's dominating, and that is the future. And Chinese people, if they're watching this show, won't they just say the same thing about the West? We got it absolutely right in the 80s with Deng Xiaoping. How China has changed until today, until this day, and the Chinese watching us is a tremendous change for the good, for the better of the world. They are now part of the developed societies of, of, of the world. We have China, one billion people who are on the same standard of living in the next years, in, throughout the next 10 years. It, and and we ha don't have to, you know, we have to look closely at politics. For 30 years, Chinese politics were opening up, were getting more liberal. There was much more public debate Tiananmen in China Square around the Olympics. Tiananmen yes. Square wasn't very liberal. I mean. Yes, it was getting more liberal from day to day. And it changed when Xi Jinping came back and power, came to power. And uh, that doesn't mean we were wrong to integrate China into the world economy and to do with those liberal minds who govern the country for 30 years. I, I think we can take a look, for example, at what's going on in Hong Kong. It, it can be an illustration of what's going on in China because there's been a much more active policy since Xi Jinping is in power to get Hong Kong back into the, uh, P so Beijing's what do you, what do, grip. What do, you, what do you think about the, um, the building of that 50 Five yeah. kilometer bridge that's inauguration taking place earlier yeah, this that, year. Yeah, that that bridge between shows, Hong Kong and the mainland. Yeah, that's a way. That's a way to show the world Hong Kong is ours. And there's been all, already some protests in, in Hong Kong because of uh, people coming from the mainland through that bridge, through through other infrastructure to to you know recolonize Hong Kong and make it more like the mainland, and stop this uh, singularity of the, the island. And these vast infrastructure projects are what you were describing earlier, Craig. Yeah, it's all part of one belt, one road. The weaponization of the dollar, the, or China's weaponization of their economy as well. And and as we've seen, for the, it started in the Obama uh, administration, which I think is the overarching issue, is the uh, extraterritorial application of U.S. law in parts of the world where it has no business. They've done this in your country. They've done it in France. Uh, they've done it in Turkey. Uh, they just did it in China. Uh, that arrest of, of the... Of, CFO of Huawei. Yeah, the CFO of Huawei. Imagine, if you will, imagine the response. If Steve Jobs' his daughter had been appointed the chief financial officer of Apple... And she was going through Hong Kong on a business trip, and the Chinese arrested her on some sort of trumped-up charges. Mm -hmm. What would the response from the United mm -hmm. States be? I think that's the way to look at it. And, the, mm -hmm. and, and what has happened here with the Trump administration, mm -hmm. they had better get a trade deal together over the next 90 days. 
or the whole house of cards is going to fall down, and it's going to fall down bad on all the markets, mm. really bad. You, you, it's going to make the last uh, uh, drop look like nothing because these guys are the, – the battlefield is not, as you were saying, it's not on – with guns anymore. It has to do with credit. It has to do with capital flow, the velocity of money. And they've got to get this deal together. And by God, the biggest mistake anyone can make is try to apply the Western DNA of democracy to what's going on in China or anywhere else in the world. It doesn't work. For God's sake, make a trade deal. If they make a trade deal, then all your kumbaya that you were just saying before, I might believe it a little bit more, but not until then. All right. Hey, this is France 24. So if we're looking back at 2018, and how about a little bit of gloating? Les Bleus returning uh, from uh, Russia victorious <laughs> in July after lifting the nation's second World Cup trophy. Uh, any team accomplishing a feat of that dimension, normally that should be parlayed into the kind of photo ops that all political leaders dream of. Little did we know the day would turn into an own goal for France's president, Emmanuel Macron. Days after insisting that his personal bodyguard had been sidelined after being filmed allegedly impersonating riot police and roughing up uh, May Day, uh, people on May Day, it turned out Alexandre Benalla, that's his name, hadn't been sidelined at all. And yes, you see him here. He was on the bus on the Champs-Élysées at, at the very end of the year, this very spot where Macron welcomed the world for the 100th anniversary commemorations of the end of World War I. Uh, yellow vest protesters would swamp that same Champs-Élysées and uh, would outmaneuver riot police. There you see him around the tomb of the unknown soldier under the Arc de Triomphe in a day of rioting, the likes of which the heart of the capital hasn't seen in decades. By then, their demands had grown well beyond the scrapping of a fuel tax hike. We don't need crumbs. We want the whole baguette. We need to eat. Now we're going into a terrible time of year because we can't afford Christmas presents for our kids. I'm 51 and it's like we're going back to the time when my dad gave us an orange and some cheese for Christmas. That's what we're back to. It's terrible. Back to, uh, back to the time when all you got was an orange for Christmas. Laura Marlowe. Um, I spent a whole, actually I went to the second riot uh, on December 8th and spent a whole day with the Gilets Jaunes. And I must have said it, it, it changed my perception of them. And I realized it is very, very hard, if not impossible, to live and support a family on 1,200 to 1,500 euro a month. You, you, you cannot do it. Yeah, if you earn and 1,700 euros a month, you're in the top 50% of earners in France. Yeah, salaries are very low in France. Uh, and these people, Macron admitted himself in his speech on December 10th that he, he said, we have ignored these people, we forgot about them. They became invisible. And I thought that was a really startling admission. And he also said that this crisis could be salutary. And I think that if uh, he really has changed social policy, if he is going to pay more attention to the, the disadvantage in France, perhaps it will turn out to have be, been a good thing. And it is a, it's definitely a turning point in, in his term of office. And It'd be very, very interesting, I think, one of the big stories of next year to see if he can recover politically. Can he continue his reform agenda or not? I think we have seen what is best about France with a gilet jaune. You What's know, best this, about of course. I wouldn't say course. that. Jordan. I would say that this capacity in 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 situations of social crisis to be courageous, to go on the street and you know, yell out for what you what you have a right to have. But why you does know, it have, we have to be violent We have. Let me think. Let me finish. We. You know. Uh, the world has always been behind France in realizing injustices. You know, it was in '68 when we, when France was the most strongest, you know, had the strongest movement to oppose uh, what happened in Vietnam. In in '36, when it was, there was a need for social uh, laws, which we all have now, France was the first to promote it. And today we have a middle class in distress in the states who voted for Trump in Germany who votes for the AFD. We have those people who are the biggest danger for our democracy and who 
who are going right wing. And in France, they're not going right wing. They're on the streets. They are telling us what they need. And they're not yelling, doing racist stuff or anything. And it's our chance beyond France to react, to finally give those Uh, lower, lower middle classes, what they owe in our, what we owe them in our society. Except that historically, um, the re the backlash to this sort of revolt has always been right wing or extreme right wing. That you had it in 1789, you had it in 1846, you had it in 1871, you had it after May 68. The 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 right uh, was firmly in power. No, the and backlash was fear. immediate, but in the long run, five, ten years on, the all this what these protest protesters were up for proved right. No, in 36, I, I in 36, everything they got proved right. In 68. Everything what they fought for, women's equality, yeah, and, proved and right 10, later, 20 years you later. Had, you know, and France has this record in 48, in 79, in 89, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. If it brings the far right to office in France, I think, uh, I, I, I hope that will not happen, but I think that is a distinct danger. But it gives us a chance now to make policies for these people, which otherwise we wouldn't even have thought of them. Oh, you, know? you finally... Thank you. I cutting into the Trotsky Association <laughs> discussion. You finally mentioned an important word, policy. Now, Macron is going to be around till 2022, whether you like it or not. Emmanuel Macron is in no political danger. He holds a supermajority in the parliament. He's not going to get impeached. As long as he's president, he can't be indicted in what they would indict him for. So guess what? In a democracy, you get what you deserve, and you deserve what you get. So we here in France are stuck with little Manu. He's the president. <laughs> What's the guy's problem? The problem is money. France has a $2.7 trillion national debt. They are paying... 62 billion dollars a year in interest on the principal. Uh, those are pretty much mobster rates, by the way. Mm. Now, what are the Gilets Jaunes asking for? Really interesting. Cut taxes to 25% of gross domestic product. Massive hiring of civil servants. It's not the Tea Party. And most important of all, very high up, They want President Manu to trigger debt forgiveness, something that is only done classically in third world countries. They can't do that without wiping out the entire banking system. The creditors won't stand for it. Not to mention the euro. Well, the euro, that's that's a discussion for another century. And, and they want the ESF, the wealth tax back, the wealth tax on capital. Well, they can't they want bring, to tax the rich yeah, no, more. Well, well, let's talk about that wealth tax. That's a very good point. The, if you had a million euros, or 1.5, wasn't it? A million or 1.5, that's what he knocked out. You don't have to pay a tax. Ladies and gentlemen, 1.5 million euros is not a lot of money in the real world. 1.5 million euros, even though we might not have it in our bank accounts, is essentially chump change. It's upper middle class money that's used to go on vacations, buy things, send your children to college. If, if you're going to tax the wealthy in France, which is what these functionnaires from the Grande Ecole can never figure out, you want to tax wealthy people? Okay, you start taxing people if they have like maybe 10 million or 15 million euros. You raise it. What, what is being done, and, and the French government has done this, they've demonized people with money, mm. and not a lot of money, and they've been doing this since old uh, Colbert was acting as finance minister <laughs> back for Louis Coutures. You could look it up, boys and girls. All right, there's another aspect of this, which is Emmanuel Macron may be in power until 2022, but he, he also... Uh, has to uh, be get his uh, reforms passed, and he has a bit of an image problem, being labeled the president of the rich when he broke his silence over the yellow vest on national television. We heard from the French president an apology, an apology of sorts. In the past, I have given the impression that it was not my concern, that I have 
other priorities. I know that I have hurt some of you with my comments. I want to be very clear with you tonight. I have fought for changing the political system in place, the behaviours, hypocrisies. It is precisely because I believe above all in our country and I love it. My legitimacy does not come from any title, any party, any clan. I get that from you and nothing else. De nul autre. My legitimacy comes from you, he says. Yeah, th there is a deep paradox in this situation, which is that president was elected because he was not part of any traditional parties, because all the people that were elected with him were not traditional politicians. And mm -hmm. it's not like five years later, it's a year and a half later. Mm -hmm. Nobody believes in them and nobody feels represented by them. I think... It, like his predecessors before. Yeah, I think there's, uh, in all this crisis, there is a, a more dangerous uh, feeling and threat of what democracy stands mm. for. Because mm. actually no one believes, and all the, the protesters, of course, they're, ask, they're, they're asking for tax cuts and things like that. But mm. they're also asking for Mac to Macron to, resi to resign and for the assembly to be solved, which is after a year and a half, quite frightening. So I think there is, um, there is a, um, an answer to this crisis that should be stronger than only uh, uh, Who's going to provide away that? Here, am I, am I don't I, know. Because Maybe there's no you, political parties you, anymore. You only you, have the extreme left and the extreme right. The socialists, they don't exist. The right wing, hello, Sarko. I mean, come on, who are you going to bring back? Uh, Francois? What, what friend, did they Dominic say? What did, the, what did the yellow vests that you spoke to tell, tell you? Um, a lot of, one of them said to me, I love this quote, uh, it's, in our, it's in our national anthem. Uh, they all, and over and over again, we saw this theme of revolutionary France of 1789. Uh, the yellow vests talked about the, uh, the states general. They wanted to set up a states general, which was a term from 1789. Uh, they've opened cahiers de doléances, which are sort of complaints registries in all the mairie. Mm -hmm. That's what they did in 1789. Uh, the basic cause of this revolt is taxation. That was the case in 1789. And you've seen so much graffiti and pictures and, and quotes about Macron being compared to Louis XVI. And as a matter of fact, the first time I ever met Macron, which was in um, 2013, when he was just an advisor to François Hollande at the Élysée, he told the, a lunch of, with journalists, he said, the French elect a president to be a monarch, and then they want to cut off his head. And that is exactly what we've seen. And I, I think the only way to get out of this endless cycle of of enthusiasm and, and love for the new, young, dynamic president, followed no. by, we want to cut off his head, you have no. to, you need massive re-education of people. You need that to change the That is much too attitude. simplest. We are in a modern democracy in France, and we are, uh, you know, don't talk about these old monarch things. And, you know, it, it just doesn't help but us. But it's true. Uh, I think it's part of the It doesn't help us. I think what we saw from Macron here, his excuses, that that is good policy. Who else in another in, is able in his position as a president to excuse himself for, for his mistakes? Mm -hmm. That is a big story. Strong, there was a big, strong so statement, and that will help Trump him, you know, uh, change his policies where he had to change. And what happens? What happens is this discussion, robust discussion, not only here in the studio but around France, continues and gets angrier. Macron alluded to it in his speech. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He's going to see more capital flight. And he's going to see more intellectual course, flight. But we need more. And that, it, we need more social policies in Europe. If you don't get his, and that's his, one us, of the basic ideas. Macron didn't only fight for, uh, you know, uh, uh, making, uh, cutting taxes for the rich in France. He fought for a social plan for Europe, which he didn't succeed because Germany was refusing it. But Germany was refusing which, it in a very special moment where we are incapable. And uh, there is still hope and need that Europe gets its social act together. Maybe which, brings us, which, brings, which brings us to what's going on on the other side of the Alps. This was the year Italy's general election bore an unprecedented coalition with the anti-establishment five-star movement finishing tops and forging an unusual alliance with the far-right league. Since then, 31-year-old Luigi Di Maio has been overshadowed by the man who on paper is the junior partner in that coalition. In fact, since the election, it feels like Matteo Salvini's been permanently on the campaign trail, using his momentum to take on all comers, like at this recent rally in Rome, where he had a dig 
at the leader of neighboring France we were talking about. Look at the images coming from France. Or the images we remember from Greece. Look at the economic crisis that even the powerful Germany, Spain and other countries are beginning to see. Look at the people wearing yellow vests in this square. Here, they guarantee public order. In Paris, they protest. I want to say that violence is never justified, but those who sow poverty reap protests. Those who sow poverty reap protest, Mlara Marlowe. Your thoughts? That's the lesson of the Gilets jaunes crisis. And it's, it's, in a broader sense, the lesson of to all liberal Democrats uh, who... Macron was the, the world leader of the liberal democratic camp. He talked about it in all of his speeches, uh, liberal democracy versus nationalist populism. Uh, this is his platform for next May's uh, European elections. Um, yes, people are poor. Income inequality is out of control. Um, it has increased vastly. I mean, mm. it, I, uh, in the book I'm going to talk about uh, later, um, a U.S. worker is now spending three mm. times as much of his income for his housing, for his rent, as he was in, in, in 1950. Uh, so we have impoverished the middle and lower classes. Um, it's true. And this has created this monster. What has Italy taught us? here in Europe this year? Well, it's, it's interesting to see the kind of people who have rejoiced in the Macron misery, which is Salvini's first. Um, Salvini was, was, was hoping to make Macron his big arch enemy in the upcoming um, May election, European election, because there he's hoping uh, with all right-wing uh, parties that the right-wing will make a big push in Europe uh, at the next election. And this, this crisis... Uh, has served him very well because now Macron is 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 more out of touch and he doesn't really he can't talk about Europe not right now so it's not like he's gonna mm. and he doesn't have any allies because as uh, George was saying uh, Merkel is now uh, out of the political scene and there's not out yet not almost <laughs> this time and she's not mm. in no in no position of power and we have not even talked about Brexit yet. <laughs> In Italy, it sort of looks like, like France's future. I mean, uh, the, Macron is very often compared to Matteo Renzi, mm -hmm. who is also young and dynamic mm -hmm. and wanting to disrupt traditional politics and so on. And both of them ended up being the object of popular hatred. Uh, and one I ask myself every day, is France going to go down the same path as Italy? Because we saw the, the, the first stages of a sort of alliance of far right and far left in the Gilets Jaunes protest, uh, which is exactly what happened in Italy. Italy was the first country to do this. And I think that's, that's really the danger uh, in France now. What has I Italy shown? <laughs> that not only France can whack Brussels over <laughs> the head and get their budget through, even if it's above the European deficit <laughs> limit. That's what it's shown. It's shown that that federalism in Europe is a myth, it's a joke, it's a nice idea, but uh, somebody better get in charge in Brussels and clean up this act. Certainly not going to be the Romanians who take over the presidency on January 1. Do you know that the European Union just voted that Romania cannot join the Schengen Treaty because they don't trust them? You could look it up, but hey, we got Romania as the presidency. What kind of dysfunctional union? is this mm. all right the 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 european uh, uh, elections what happens there uh what happens with brexit we're going to be talking about it in our look at 2019 i want to thank craig Kapidis, laura marlow georg bluma hamdan mustafavi and thank you for being with us here for the world this year